Hello, everyone. I trust you are well. You are keeping very well by the grace of God. We are also well. Grace, my UGRC 150 students. And this is our second lecture. Since we will try to interspace our lecture online, this virtual lecture with live sessions and also quite extensive slides that we have made available to our coordinator. Our video lectures hopefully will be a bit more rounded. That means it will highlight the main stuff that we think that you should know. Then you would also augment this effort with your own study of the manual that is the required text, and then you will engage the very extensive, you know, slides with several examples, okay, that we now have the permission to upload onto resources. You would also engage the live sessions, which as I have communicated, uh, communicated on several platforms, are meant to take your questions and interact with you and clarify concerns that you may have. So you meet your lecturers or instructors. There are several TAs per group assisting you. You will meet your TA assist, uh, assigned to each of my groups for both main campus and city campus. All these efforts are aimed at helping you. You have to engage all your content in the university for your various courses. That is how university learning is done respectfully okay it is not a spoon feeding kind of setting in the university you research so you are giving content you are guided you are giving lectures whether in person online via video interaction etc it is a guide that is why you have a course outline at the onset of the semester so you know what expectations are, uh, you know, what the expectations are of you and what you should also expect of the instructor lecture, et cetera. So please have that push join so that you, you, would, you would find yourself settled into the various courses you are doing. And so this course is specifically UGRC 150 uh, lecture two on the topics, definitions, verbal disputes, and substantive disagreements. You would see the, the, uh, these topics in your course manual, the textbook. You would have several examples. You have a bit more of an elaboration and all that. If I teach you other courses, you would want to be minded that this is UGIC 150. So just because you see Dr. Mrs. Nancy Malva for GMP, on those slides should not mean obviously that you should study that for that other course. This is UGRC 150, so we can proceed now. Now, definitions. In our previous lecture, we saw that definitions are one type of declarative. When we say a declarative, we have already studied that, so you can play back the video, can study the course manual, you can look at the slides posted on Sakai for you to refresh your memory on that, but this is a build up. This is one type of declarative and we call it a definition. Every definition has two aspects. Whenever we give you the meaning of a word, that's what a definition is. You should take note that it has two aspect i have not said two parts okay definitions also have two parts but for now i'm talking about aspects you can think of definitions in two ways that's what i mean by aspects you can think of definitions as having what a connotation whenever i give you the meaning of a word i'm i have given you the words what connotation what it connotes what it stands for 
what its criteria is. So if I say a bachelor is an unmarried adult male, I have just given you one connotation of the word what bachelor, one meaning, one definition. So the definition here is referring to what the word means, how I'm able to determine who or what a bachelor is. That is one of the meanings I just gave you, an, an unmarried adult male. But you know immediately that when I say I am in the university doing my bachelor's, then I couldn't mean that I am in the university doing my unmarried man. Okay, so that immediately tells you that I, the word bachelor could have more than one connotation. It could mean the degree and in the university at first entrance, okay? Then we could also even think of bachelor as a type of button. I know there is a bachelor's button so the tailors can bear us out there. All these are connotations of the word bachelor, okay? Now, you would then realize immediately that depending on which of the connotations of the word that I use, so our example was what? Bachelor. When I said bachelor is an unmarried adult male, I gave you a connotation of the word bachelor, one of the ways of understanding the word bachelor, one meaning you can associate with the word bachelor, okay? An unmarried adult male. Based on that, if I asked you to point to or give me examples of that meaning of the word bachelor, you would point to the unmarried men you know. So for example, Kofi, Kwame, uh, Kujo, maybe yourself as a student, if you are a male and an unmarried adult male listening to me, then you will be a particular example of bachelor defined as what an unmarried adult male. So these examples I am pointing to, this particular instance of the word bachelor, is what is defined or what we mean when we say the denotation of that word. So every definition has a connotation and a denotation based on the specific connotation associated with that word, you are able to identify its particular denotation. And as soon as the denotation of a word change, excuse me, as soon as the connotation of a word changes, its denotation will change. So if we define bachelor as an unmarried adult male, that is one of its connotations, what it means, then immediately the denotation will refer to Kofi, Kwame, Kojo, etc. However, if we define bachelor as a degree and in the university at first entrance, for example, that is a different connotation of a, the same word bachelor. This con connotation will have which denotation? De uh, bachelor's degree in what? Uh, maybe economics, in philosophy, bachelor's degree in so and so. So we will now be pointing to what? If you like papers or document or certificate, not necessarily to human being. The denotation has changed because the connotation of the word changed. All right, so those, that is the first thing you should know about definitions. They have aspects. Definition has aspects, either connotation or denotation. I used bachelor uh, in the previous slide. Now on this slide, you would see the word chair. A chair is a furniture we sit on as quite crude. Uh, you know, almost vague, but it is still a way of thinking of a chair. You are sitting on a chair. Maybe some of you are sitting on a, a bed, etc. But if I say a chair is a furniture we sit on, I've given you one meaning you can associate with the word chair. So I've just given you a connotation of the word chair. The second one is a chair is the head of an institution. See, the chair of electoral commission, for example the chair of council of state. So these are this new meaning of the word chair. This is another connotation of the word chair. You can think of a chair as the person who steers the affairs 
of a meeting, the chair of uh, 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 the board of directors. He's not he or she's not necessarily the head of an institution, but he or she would ensure that everything is done according to order. Okay, so during a wedding reception, we could we could ask a, a very uh, you know articulate person, or if you like. Uh, an honorable person, man or woman, to chair that reception. It doesn't mean that the person is, that, that reception has become an institution. It is not an institution. It is just a temporal setting, but would need someone to organize and ensure that things are done properly. So everyone would address the chair, even when we want to <laughs> do some Mr. Chair. Meanwhile, he's not, he or she's not the one going to do what is going to be done, but we see him or her as a person steering the affairs of a meeting. And that is another connotation of the word chair. So you would see that the word chair may have more than one meanings. That is all there is when we say the word chair has several connotations. Now, based on those different connotations, you would notice that we'll have different denotations. So if a chair is a furniture we sit on, that is a connotation I've given to you. You can now identify, list, mention the specific denotations of chair defined as what? That which we sit on. That will include what you are sitting on. You can point to it, you can touch it, you can list it, you can mention what the denotation. But the connotation you can't listed you see that it is the criteria it is the actual meaning that's what that's the giving connotation then will determine the specific denotation i think that is straightforward you shouldn't have difficulties distinguishing connotation from denotation now what if that is clear to you then look at this example on the screen and for the sake of our special students we would read them out. The legislature agreed to table the motion for another day. That's first example. Look at the next one. The rows and columns in the table are too complex. Then the third one, your breakfast is already on the table. I am sure these three examples, if you play back the recording, you will hear them again for your benefit you would see immediately that there are three different connotations of the word table being used. And so if you were asked to identify the denotation for each of those meanings, you should be able to do that. Now, what would that help us do? Detecting equivocation. What would our knowledge of connotations help us do? When you go to the complete slides, that will be uploaded. I should be, I should upload that as soon as this video comes out on to Sakai. There will be just slides. They will be a bit more extensive. You see quite a number of reasons why it is important to know what definitions, connotations, denotations. I, I, I gave you some inkling of those in the previous video also. Everything we do in academia ultimately aims at what? Feeding and solving problems of society. Medicine, law, sociology, political science, philosophy, religions. We are studying not just so that we know and impress ourselves and others that we have PhD and professorial ranks, ranks, okay? The aim is to be able to impact society and help solve problems at all levels of human life, at least as we know it until the, I mean, until we cease to exist, you know. So if you are not able to impact or make meaning to the people that you seek to impact knowledge to, then you didn't achieve anything. That is why it is important to know definitions, meanings, how to pass on knowledge, how to help people. So I have given several examples and I still want to do so. If I want to be meaningful to a class one child, I have to know how to 
package that information about, say, brushing your teeth if I am a pediatrician and I want to help the child to understand if I'm a dentist, I cannot present that information or knowledge the way I would have done if I was speaking to mommy or daddy or grandpa or grandma. So the child may want to know, you, you may want to present it in an accessible manner. So it is not enough to know. It is important to know how to package knowledge, how to package solutions to people in a way that they can assess or access that information. Okay. I, I mentioned the Fisher Folk thing. If I have to, if I'm a government appointee and I want to make them buy into a policy, I have to be concerned about the language, not just whether it is English or Ga, but how I present the content is part of what we mean by language. If I'm teaching a level 100 class, I cannot present my content as I would do if I were teaching an MPhil class or a PhD class. So the student may be so impressed. Wow, this lecturer knows her stuff. Woo, University of Ghana has some quality men. But that is not what we are there for. That is just secondary. Did they get the content? And are they able to build on it? Now think of it. You cannot teach a child how to feed. I keep saying a child just for, for you to get the point. The child is not learning to eat at six months or maybe two years, one year, depending on which model you are using. And then you want to start with bones because bones have rich calcium. You will kill the child. Look at the muzzle. You are doing my, the Eba the, Eneguzi that I, I really love about my Nigerian friends. Is that how you want to start teaching the three months old how to eat? Or to, she, the child was born today, say what? I'm going to give the child some good food with a bunch of caca. That's good meat soup. Damn. <laughs> Damn it, people. You would not help the child, even though the food is very nutritious. So meanings, you know, definitions are meant to help you avoid obscurities when you are presenting content at various levels. It is meant to help you impact knowledge. And that is what I emphasize when I engage my students. There are other very valuable reasons why we should engage such a topic in critical thinking. You will see more of those on the slides that will be uploaded. They are quite extensive with several examples. So you can appreciate the value of definitions. Now, on the screen now, you see equivocation. It is a crime. It is not something you should be proud of. So, unless, of course, you are, you are doing poetry or rap, that one is an intentional error that brings out certain quality. So, when we are equivocal about how you are presenting your rap song or your, poet, your poetry, then that is a... a uh, an admirable quality. So let's see what equivocation is. Now see, it is an error associated with connotations of a word. If more than one connotation of a word is used in the same context without any signal of the shift, mm, and the intention is to manipulate or to persuade, then you, the speaker, you are accused of committing equivocation. You want to use the different meanings, the different connotations of one word. We have seen the remember bachelor, the button, bachelor, the degree, bachelor, the un unmarried adult meal. All of these three meanings refer to one word, one word, bachelor. Now, if you use these different meanings in the same context without signaling your audience that I have shifted the meaning I'm associating with bachelor. I've shifted from one of the meanings to the other. You don't do the signal. So you presume, you make it look as if you are just using one meaning of the word bachelor and they all apply. We say you are being equivocal. You are tricking us. You are impressing us by playing on the word. You will see equivocation again in, in unit 10 when you deal with fallacies. 
and you call it the fala one of the fallacies that manipulates the language because you are playing on the word. Let's see some examples for clarity. I don't see why women are always complaining that they do not enjoy the same freedom as men do. It is a free country, so take notes. It is a free country. So what's the problem? Everybody in Ghana has here is free to do what they like. Now this person is equivocating big time on the word freedom. I don't see why women are always complaining that they do not enjoy the same freedom as men do. You don't see that? You think free, this notion of freedom, this meaning of freedom that you are using here is the same as you saying that Ghana is a free country. Now compare the two. When two people, a man and a woman happily married, get busy at night and they, there is an issue, who carries the child? for nine months or sometimes more or less. It is a woman. Is a woman free to jump around and wear her high heels and eat what she likes like she was doing before that issue? No, the man can continue to claim that he's a virgin like my husband can do freely <laughs> without any fear of favor. The woman may not be able to. And it is not anything about a choice. You see, I am trying to make you see that whereas women cannot decide whether they will do that thing at the end of the month. Do you remember that? The gentleman can. The gentleman doesn't, doesn't get moody and has, has to buy a sanitary pads. So the woman has restrictions. When it comes to maternity leave, the woman may, I say may because some may choose not to give birth at all. That's one central instance of freedoms that are restricted when it comes to the gender called woman and the gender called man. So when you talk of men and women having same freedoms and then you come and link it to uh, the freedom that we have in a country, you are confusing two meanings. You are equivocating. It looks very good, an argument that you are making, but you, someone just has the objection, my Lord. Counsel is equivocating. We are advocating for the woman's freedom as X, Y, and Z, not her freedom as a member of the nation or the state called Ghana. That's a confusion of two meanings of freedom. Now look at, there goes the third one. Everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they like. Says who? Are the prisoners in Ghana? Prisoners in Ghanaian prisons, are they in Ghana? Are they free to do what they like? When the president said, because of COVID-19, and I agreed with him fully, at the time that it was so intense, we were all locked down into our rooms. We don't care your pedigree. In fact, we were running ourselves into our rooms and locked up. But were we free to do what we like? Were we not in a free country? Was our country no longer a free country? So you have to be careful how you are confusing these three connotations of the word free. Even now that there is no COVID-19, are you free? I mean, if everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they like, then get up and go and slap every lecturer that is giving you a headache and let's see if you are free to do that. So we may be free naturally, but we are not free in a different sense of the word. Free education is free and we applaud a very good policy, but it is not free, sir, because I even have to get up and wash my face before I go. You know, so we have to be careful when we are confusing different connotations of one word. And you see some good content on that, uh, an equivocation on the word law, when you look at your content unit five, okay? The various connotations of the word law. I think there is a, a talk on homosexuality, <clears throat> excuse me, and how some two, you know, council members are arguing and we see an equivocation on the word law as moral law, law as empirical law, law as a, a statutory. I mean, if, if two people fight at the top 
They're fetching water. Two ladies are fighting. They scratch their faces. That's a civil issue. They are breaking a law, yes, but just civil law. Okay. If a lady decides to wear her swimsuit to the lecture hall, we, we, we may not need to arrest her. That is, that is a mo a, perhaps a moral issue. We'll use our eyebrows and our tongues and cut a on her and tell her, oh, so do you have to do this? Especially when she wants to sit where her brothers are sitting with her swimsuit at the lecture hall. You know, at the same time, we will be so shocked that this lady would be breaking a law if she was wearing kaba and slit. I mean, a full-fledged kaba and slit with gloves and has covered her hair, wearing spectacles, shoes and you know, sneakers and socks because she wants to be all holy. She wants to be all covered. And she's wearing this to play tennis. Oh, we will look at her because she's breaking a certain law, but we will not arrest her. But if a father rapes her own daughter, hey, excuse me, his own daughter, we think he has broken another kind of a law, the criminal one. It will be the state versus the father, not the family people, not the child, child herself. It is the state. What am I trying to show you? So there are different meanings, connotations associated with that word law. And so when we say they are not breaking any law, but what, have, what law have I broken? You want to be careful not to equivocate. See that example in the text I've pointed to you to. It will help your understanding. So you don't commit equivocation, but more importantly, you don't allow people to equivocally have their way on you. You have to pause with all humility, raise up your hand or point out to that policymaker or the person that you are making a decision, but we are equivocating. Can you clarify this? Which sense of the word this are you referring to? Is it family as they say brothers and sisters in the law? Do we mean family as we share common identity with Christ? Or is it from, I'm speaking that because that is what I'm able to uh, 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 point to. So apologies if you don't share in that. Or are we saying family as someone that we have the same blood with, whatever that means also. Or are we saying family is a friend? You see, it's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And you might consider that person as more of a family than even the person that presumably came from them. So we want to be careful in our use of such words. And you will see that such an understanding will take us to open textured terms versus uh, well-defined terms. In the GIF, we will get to that slide. But understand the very important emphasis I have laid on avoiding equivocation, unless you can use it to, uh, as it were, do your poetry. So then people will be intrigued by how you are using that same way. The first one is Oba as in the woman, but Oba, if you don't speak as anti, don't worry, there are several examples. Oba you know, so it is Oba as a woman, but when Oba, when she can, I, I like to listen to our our nice rappers on how they are putting the words together unnecessarily on everything. Okay, so there are two extra examples on the screen to help you understand equivocation, which is an error of reasoning. I don't see how you can say you are an ethical person. It's so hard to get you to do anything. Your work ethic is so bad. Okay, so this person is confusing being an ethical person with what? Work ethic. They are not the same. The word is the same, but the meanings associated with being ethical. Being ethical is a matter of morality. Having work ethic is do's and don'ts of the office. Don't confuse the two. Example three, sure, philosophy helps you argue better. But do we really need to encourage people to argue? Philosophy's training that helps you to argue better. This argue means to present reasons why a certain view should be supported or not. That is not the same as encouraging people to argue. The encouraging people to argue here as the person is using it is exchange of words, fighting, because the word argue would mean several things. Okay, so the person ends it by saying there's enough hostility in this world already. That is equivocation and we want to avoid it, right? Now, what else do I want you to know in the unit? Types of definitions. 
you would see lexica. These ones you read and you understand. So I cannot spoon feed you on that. I will not be helping you. You need to take the textbook. You could borrow it. Like I said, those who did it previously won't have use for the textbook again. You could buy it if you want to own your own. Please access it from the philosophy department. It's university done. I think last semester it was 30 cities then. So if you go there, you will get it. All students, all the over 8,000 or so of your main campus and city campus can access it. If you come by, then you borrow. If not, then you what whichever way. <laughs> okay. But respectfully get it so that you can read and expand all the various aspects of the types of definitions. But I highlight some very pertinent points here to help you understand them. A lexical definition, look at the word from lexicon. Is that type of definition we find in a dictionary? It is mostly the general meaning of the word. An ostensive definition, the word ostensive to ostensiate, to point to, okay? Ostensive, to point to or to demonstrate. There are certain words, the simplest meaning you can give, you can use to give, you know, the simplest way of giving meaning to that word would be what to point to the word, especially if I'm teaching a child, say, color red or color blue. You know, how do I teach a child a certain color? Are you going to sound all technical? I'm talking his secondary color. You miss the desert. No, two years. Take a book that is blue. Say, you see this color? That is color blue. You are pointing to give meaning. It will have its shortcomings because the child will think there is no other blue than what you have pointed to. But that's okay. For, for a fair understanding, the child will learn to add and add and add and be better at describing the color. If you pointed to the sky as a blue color and the next morning the sky is ash, you can understand why pointing to definitions as ostensive definitions could have a, a, a weaknesses. All definitions do. All right. So sometimes it's not just pointing to, but what demonstrating. How would you show a white person what cake is? Uh, excuse me, what uh, fufu is? We can demonstrate or what pan logo the dance pan logo is. You don't stand there and say pan logo, pan logo, pan logo is the dance that you shake your body. Right? It will not help. You would you may have to show it by doing it. Okay. And that is what uh, an ostensive definition is. An operational definition gives you the steps or instructions to follow to get to that word's meaning. There's, there's a fine example in the one that I saw on the slides by the coordinator, Chrissy, uh, Dr. Chris. He says, um, if you want to know even number, take the numbers one to 10, for example. Divide each by two. Check to see if there is a remainder. If there is no remainder, then that number that had no remainder is what? An even number. So I, this is just giving you steps, steps to follow to achieve the meaning of that word, operational definition, okay? You give the steps or the instruction that will lead to that word, where it's meaning. The stipulative definition is by fiat, by agreement, a word that we give our meaning to. You can think of it as jargons, if you like. Okay, but these are mostly not necessarily institutionalized, like theoretical uh, definitions, which are normally institutionalized. Okay, theory based, theoretical definition, institution based. Okay, so when the philosopher says uh, argument, you, you must understand it as it, how we would define argument, it may not necessarily be the everyday use of that word. Inflation by the economists. How the economist defines inflation may not simply mean taking a balloon and blowing air into it, no. Okay, so theoretical definition is a bit more institutionalized, theory-based definition. Look at water is H2O. For you to understand the meaning of water as what H2O, you must know H as hydrogen, the two is a subscript representing maybe two molecules of hydrogen or something. They're all 
is oxygen, it is not a zero in order. You must know a whole chemistry to be able to grasp that meaning of water as what H2O. Meanwhile, water is also a colorless, odorless substance that is blah, 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 blah. That is a lexical definition of the same water. Now I was on stipulative. Stipulative, think of home cho. When the Vanda says charge, Vanda, mm, Commonwealth gentlemen, if they say we are going to charge, you can think of charge as going to get your phone's battery and getting a, a plug. That is not what charge means for a vanda. So if you are not a vanda, you'll be there and you'll speak across and, and, and you think that, oh, they say we are going to charge. As at the time that I knew about what charge means on, on the ground campus, it meant that maybe we are going on a demos, demonstration or we, we are getting prepared, psyching ourselves up for, you know, some, some uh, public event, okay? Now, think of Osmo, you know, I am an infantryman girls old student. And when I was in school then, you know, we, we could be amongst our, our visitors and then someone say, Osmo, by tapping the shoulder, by tapping their, the, the other lady's shoulder, pass by you and say, Osmo, Tapping, it is just a signal to you, fine lady, and my ladies will understand that. Okay, so you wouldn't need to give all the details. It is not how we would normally use that word in every day, and that is a stipulative definition. It is how we agree to use that word, and we here could could be even informal. Okay, so take note of the keywords, logical definition, dictionary, extensive definition, point to or demonstrate, operational definition, steps or instruction, stipulative definition by fiat, theoretical definition, theory based. Okay, then there is the real or ideal or eliminative essential definition. That is where the definendum can replace the definitions in all contexts of use. In all contexts of use, and the meaning will not change. That type of definition, see that it is exceptional. It is called a real definition. You can think of it as an ideal definition, eliminative definition, or essential definition. And I said, which type of definition is that? Is that definition whose definendum can replace the definitions in all contexts of its use without changing the meaning. The meaning won't change. So you'll be asking, what is definiendum definience? In the previous lecture, we showed you the parts of the definition. Definiendum, the unknown word. Definience, the part that is giving meaning to the unknown. So think of the subject of a, a definition, if you like, as what the definiendum, and it's predicates the definience. Now we are saying that a definition is real. It is really a definition. When what? When its definiendum can replace the definience wherever you use the word, wherever you use the word, without its meaning changing. That would mean that a bachelor is an unmarried man cannot be a real definition because it isn't the case that wherever we use the word bachelor, it will mean an unmarried adult male. That is not the case at all. Sometimes when we use the word bachelor, it means something else. But how about the definitions we see in mathematics mostly and in such deductive studies like logic and physics? You would see that their meanings are real. Why? Because wherever you use that word, it will represent the meaning associated to it and vice versa. More on that on your slides and during our live session. Now, what else should you know on definitions? I mentioned open textured or if you like open class concept versus well-defined concept when I was explaining equivocation moments ago. Every word which can have several meanings is described as open texture. Now let's clarify that. Look at that. 
a word is open textured or essentially contestable. That's another way of describing that. A word is open textured or essentially contestable if it has several connotations and therefore any given meaning can be contested even within the same discipline. That's how I make it accessible to you. When you read in the textbook, you may find some many more words being said about this, but this is how I present it to you. The word's meaning can be contested, essentially speaking. When we are looking at what the word means essentially, I could think of family, like I said earlier, as the one who takes care of my needs. You may say, no, 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 family, Family doesn't have to be that. Family has to be the one that shares your mother's blood. Another person may say, no, 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 my real family is the one who shares my father's blood. Someone will say, no, 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 family is humanity. We are all one big world family. Someone will say, no, 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 family is rather those who are bought by the blood. We are family, whether from uh, uh, up there or down south, we are all family. So you see the essential meaning of the word family can be contested. You see, not, not the prescribed meaning for a certain group at a certain time, but what it's the meaning of that word essentially stands for can be contested. And almost all our terms in, in human conversation are like that, with the exception of those that I mentioned earlier that are found in well-defined or if you like deductive studies you see those words will not have you can't have your own meaning of even number if you are doing mathematics hmm? in maths we, we will all agree on what the concept plus mean in logic we understand the meanings we associate with our words you can't have your own meanings to it the only thing is that such disciplines are also empty of content you will understand that when we get to deductive versus inductive studies. So it, it is important at this stage to understand that such terms like family, justice, fidelity, you know that in certain religions, for example, you will not be called an infidel if you had more than a wife. But in others, it might be a sign of infidelity that you have more than one wife. Look at democracy and the various meanings people associate with it. Some think it's talk, make I talk some. Others think it is tell them what you want. Others also think it is all of us must make some of, must be part of the decision making. Others think, I said, I mean, different connotations and therefore open texturedness of terms like those that we have seen. Your textbook gives you several. I keep pointing you to that so that you will engage it for your own sake. You will do continuous assessments. You will do final assessments. Some of your assessments are lecture specific or group specific. So the lecturer handling the group will manage it. Your final exam will include questions from your lecturers and the coordinators and all the teaching team. So your focus point is the content which is accessible to all students, okay? And that is your, your EGRC 150 test book. So go there and find some more examples on uh, open textured terms. Now, how about well-defined terms? The term is well-defined if its definition makes completely clear which objects or individuals or properties are correctly called by that word. Its meaning is not contestable in the discipline in question. Mm -hmm. Well-defined terms are the ones I just gave examples to and pointed you to. They are common in deductive studies like math and logic. So I say refer to the definition of even number in the prescribed test. An even number is a number which divides two equally without a remainder. Didn't I think I mentioned that. And so you can say as for you, you are doing mathematics, but when you say even number, you mean something else. You go to the market, you buy two, two CDs banku, three CDs uh, tuna. And then you tell the woman that two plus three is equal to one. Hey, you, she will show you that she may not know how to write what a uh, two plus three, but she understands 
two plus three. You can't have your own meanings to mathematical terms and concepts, but you can have your own meanings to sociological terms like family, like culture, like uh, uh, what is that? justice. You have your own legal notion of what it means to be just, okay? So that is why the, in, in, such concepts encourage continuous deliberation, they encourage continual reflection. And so the people engage in such humanities and social science and social studies continually work at improving and helping get a more converging view of those concepts, but they are not closed concepts. Such concepts are open texture, whereas the mathematical and the deductive studies concepts are closed or well-defined, if you like. All right, problems with definitions. A definition could be broad, it's a problem. It could be secular, it could be narrow, it could be vague. Look at the names, they should point you to something. I always tell students, if you don't know how to work out these problems, how to diagnose these problems, just ask yourself, what is the, uh, the essence of a definition? A definition, a definition aims at giving meaning to an unknown word. So whenever you have a definition, it means the definiendum is what you don't know. The definience is what you are using to know it. So if I say a bachelor is an unmarried adult male, I'm just saying if you don't know a bachelor, look at an unmarried adult male. Okay. If you don't know a bachelor, then look at an unmarried adult male. If you don't know a bachelor, look at an unmarried adult male. It means that for your diagnosis, if you want to diagnose a definition, you can tell by relating the unknown word with what? The known words. Let's do some examples. So you take note of broad, narrow, secular, vague. If I tell you development is to develop the nation and embark on developmental projects, it means I am giving you the meaning of the word de development. I am saying, if you don't know development, look at developing a nation. Now, that is secular. I didn't add anything. I just repeated what I don't know, people, eh? in what, what I, so I'm not helping you understand. I'm using the very word that needs to be explained or needs to be defined. I'm repeating it in the supposed definition I'm giving. If I say logic is to is being logical, what did I do? I did nothing. A driver is the person who drives a machine. What have I said? It is secular. You are repeating the unknown. What? In the known. You are using what you don't know, which we are seeking clarity or meaning for in what your definition. So that is straightforward a problem uh, that we label as what secularity. Now let's look at the others. When do we say a definition is narrow? When you restrict mm, the meaning you are giving to just a subset, you are, in other words, you have narrowed the meaning of the word to just a few instances. You say you have narrowed the definition. Let me give you another example to show that. When I say, uh, um, 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 I want one that is so straightforwardly accessible to you. Philosophy is the study of the works of Plato. Philosophy is the study of the works of Plato. I'm saying if you don't know philosophy, look at the works of Plato. You will know what philosophy is. Now, the problem with this is that all the other works that are equally philosophy have been left out. We have excluded legitimate members in what? The definitions. We have left them out. How? 
we say, if you don't know philosophy, look at the works of Plato. What about Socrates? What about Aristotle? What about Kwame Jechi? What about uh, uh, Kant? These are all great, these are all great philosophers. So if I, and their works are philosophy or philosophical. So if I say that if philosophy is the study of the works of Plato, then it means the person who is not studying Plato will not count as a philosopher or will not be considered as studying philosophy. That narrows the set. That narrows the meaning of philosophy. I hope you understand that. Then when is a definition too broad? It will be too broad if it includes members that do not legitimately belong there. For example, when you say that if a, an antelope, that is also in your slides that you see, an antelope is a four-legged animal. It means I'm saying if you don't know antelope, look at a four-legged animal. You know what that will mean. Lion and dog and cat will all be labeled or described as what? Antelope. Because of how you defined it. You said an antelope is a four-legged animal. Okay. So we know broadness and you have to practice with all the examples on your slides in your test book during our lecture uh, discussions and during your tutorial times with your TEs. Make use of these precious resources given to you as persons and content and do not complain. You can get a straight A in the course without any stress at all if you put your mind to it and engage the content, not if you sit and expect that it will happen. I have to be frank with you. It, the course is called critical thinking. You can't underestimate your lecturers and your instructors. They know what they are about. So you have to engage so that you, you do well. And then the course passes through, you just don't pass through it and go. All right, how about vagueness? When you are vague, it means you are imprecise. It is not clear. And oftentimes it is either because you are using language symbolically or you are using some terms in a way that could mean several other things, okay? It means you are vague. Imprecision is a word. Normally, when people use language figuratively, symbolically, equivocally, uh, make, uh, did I say equivocally? Let's take that that out for now, uh, metaphorically, mm? symbolically, idiomatically. When you are speaking that way, you will be vague. Why? Because you are not being specific. Now, on the screen, we have some trial questions. Look at the boss telling the lady, being efficient, excuse me, efficiency is being efficient at what you do in this office. What crime is being committed here? Think through it. We, we can discussed during our session. The meaning of evil is murder. This means, this one, I'm telling you, if you don't know evil, look at what, murder. Can you see that that is narrow? It's narrow. It means you have left out gossip. You have left out snatching people's husband or wives. You have left out stealing. You have left out backbiting. They are all evil. But you say the meaning of evil is murder. That's, that's a narrow definition. The first one, obviously, is secular. The second one, a dinosaur is a prehistorical creature. This is too broad. We may end up calling unicorns and every prehistorical creature we see as what? A dinosaur. You have broadened it. Development is to develop the nation. You understand that that is secular. Religion is the opiate of the masses. This is a symbolic use of religion. Opium or opiate is something you take in as a sedative to forget your problems. So if the person speaks this way, if you're a political scientist, or I think also social and political philosopher, you would have seen this phrase. Okay? We don't take religion and swallow it like we take medicine or inhale it like we we sniff something, you see? 
So the person is speaking figuratively. This is vague. Now, Volta ladies are snobs. This one is not even a definition at all. The person is passing judgment. Okay. So I just took you through some examples that you find in your text on that page to help your understanding of problems with definition. We will quickly do um, types of discourse, which is in unit three, but you can easily build on from unit two to unit three as part of the video content. Then in our interactive sessions, we can trash them all out. That unit has basically some few content there, something small to add. So you are supposed to know what an argument is, what it means to narrate or a narration, an instruction, and then a rhetorical polemic. So the unit is on types of discourse. This, this time, discourse means a collection of sentences, not just one, so passages, not just one. What we did in unit one was what? Types of sentences, one, one, one. And then we even went all the way to describe uh, declaratives as statements, some type of sentence called declarative. We took declarative alone and then had three types of declaratives, you see. But here we have types of what? Discourse, discourse, the collection of sentences, so passages, argument, narration, instruction, and rhetorical polemic. Okay. Now, if we want to engage that one also, that unit, read and find out what will I call an argument? When is a passage a narration? When will I think of a passage as an instruction? When is it a rhetorical polemic? I think you should give yourself that homework. And then when I meet you, hopefully after our first week, we can engage questions on that. So in the first week on, on Monday, this is UGRC. So we have all our UGRCs on Monday both group two main campus and then the city campuses groups groups three and four would all meet on monday but at your scheduled times with your specific links the rationale is to take your questions after you have read listened to the lecture engaged it jotted down your specific points of clarification that you seek so we open the session we do some introductions and then we start taking your queries based on those groups. That's what the sessions will be for. We meet again, then we'll engage the units that you, you might have read. So let's work that way and you will do fine. I wish you a happy Sunday. Have a wonderful week ahead of you and put your mind to it. I want to encourage you, tell yourself, I'm in school to learn. I will make use of all available opportunities given to me. I will respond to matters rather than complain and seek help rather than judge. And if you have that posturing, before you know it, your transcript will smile at you like it has done to our many, many students. I wish you well as always. All the best.